Um, so my name is Alex. Uh, I teach nonviolent communication, um, amongst a million other things I do in my life. But I'm here today to share nonviolent communication with you, uh, and that's exciting to me. Um, so where to begin? Nonviolent communication uh, starts with a book written by Marshall Rosenberg uh, that he wrote out of his work in the civil rights movement. Uh, Marshall Rosenberg was involved in that and then studied the works of uh, Dr. King and Gandhi and just kind of analyzed their speech patterns, well, how they communicated, how they uh, conveyed their ideas, and then distilled it into a, uh, like a distilled method of communicating um, that we'll look at shortly. Uh, so by no means does Marshall Rosenberg claim that he made this up or came up with the idea. It's a lot of the concepts we're going to talk about today, people are going to be like, yeah, I knew about that. <laughs> um, and a lot of the things are very, uh, we're aware of them, but it's good to keep them at the forefront. And we're going to talk about some things that we probably don't really know about um, or really keep it on the forefront of our minds often. So what nonviolent communication really tries to strive for is oftentimes we find ourselves in situations of apparent conflict where we're fighting with each other uh, and we want to change those situations of apparent conflict into situations of cooperation. Situations where we're not trying to get my needs met and I don't care whether your needs get met or not, but rather let's meet everyone's needs. Let's get together and find a solution that works for all of us involved. Uh, rather than just one or, or a small group of individuals. So how do we do that, right? <laughs> That's the hard part, yeah. <laughs> that sounds really nice, but how do you do that? Um, well, a quick, simple uh, start to that would be um, what often happens in those conflict situations is you get caught up in your fight, flight, or freeze reaction, right? Your adrenaline <coughs> starts running, um, now all of a sudden you're either got to fight this opponent, that you got to run away from this opponent, or you're just a deer in the headlight and you're just like, oh, I can't do anything. <laughs> um, so we want to, ultimately, we're trying to sidestep activating that fight, flight, or freeze reaction in ourselves and in other people that we're communicating with. Um, we want to just avoid that altogether and staying in that calmer, uh, normal mental state where we're not activated to this I have no choices except for these three things. Um, it's a lot easier to communicate, to find solutions that actually work for everyone because we're calmer, we have more patience, we have more time. Uh, <coughs> and a lot of that has to do with looking past uh, what I'm going to call often uh, enemy images that we construct of other people and that we construct <coughs> of ourselves. Um, so often we make moralistic judgments about other people in those conflict situations where like, well that person's a jerk, that person's a bad person, or we'll make other moralistic judgments that that person's a good person, that person's righteous and virtuous and I need to follow them. Uh, but making those kinds of moralistic judgments creates images of people rather than really seeing who they really are rather than really connecting with the real person that's there. If you all want to grab uh, handouts as you come in, that'd be fantastic. Um, so we want to deconstruct those images, right? We don't want to see images, we want to see the true empathetic human beings that really exist. Uh, we don't want to see idols, basically, or, or demons. Um, so the goal, what is, what is the goal of nonviolent communication? The goal is not to get what we want. If your goal in using, if you take from this class and go home and try to use nonviolent communication to get everything that you want and it's not working, the reason is that that's not the intended goal. <laughs> um, the goal of nonviolent communication is to develop and build relationships and connections based on honesty and empathy. That's the only goal we have. It's the only goal we have. It's our intention behind everything we do, every way that we communicate, is to have the intention and the goal to connect authentically, honestly, in other words, and to do that connection empathetically. But it's hard in our, in, in our culture, right? We live in a domination culture where, uh, where the tools that we're taught to get what we want and to get social change is to go to anger and to go to guilt 
and to go to shame and to go to moralistic judgments. Um, how often do we hear, how dare you vote for three strike laws? Those are racist policies and you're promoting racist policies. You're perpetuating a racist system. I heard that. I'm not going to want to communicate with you. I'm not going to want to sit and have a dialogue about what the real problem is with three strike laws. And there are, obviously. Um, but that's how we're often taught that that's how you get social change happen. Similarly, on the flip side, how often do we hear, uh, what do you mean you support regulating marijuana? Don't you know that that will only help the cartels? Don't you know that it's just going to result in uh, social decay? Uh, that you're just going to be lazy all day? Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so all of that though, both sides. So you're making an enemy image of the other person. You when you say, when or the person when they say that remark. You know, three strike laws are racist policies, and you're an immoral politician. When I say that, I'm making an enemy image of that politician. When the politician says you're just a lazy dope addict, they're making an enemy image of of you. And then the next trick. Is then once I hear that, so once I'm the politician has heard that, I'm also in my fight flight freeze reaction. I'm I'm dealing with an opponent who's trying to kill me, and <coughs> I have to fight back against it. So now I'm going to develop an enemy image back at them. Now that I'm doing that, they're going to shoot it back at me, and then we just spiral out of control. Um, so NBC really tries for an alternative to that system. Really tries for an alternative to that enemy image. You're my enemy, I'm here to get what I want, and, and you're not going to get what you want. System. So, let's actually, so that's just the intro. Let's get into the actual meat and potatoes of what nonviolent communication is now. Um, so, there's two aspects to nonviolent communication. Um, the first is empathy. I'm going to talk about empathy, and then we'll go to the second part later. So, empathy. What is empathy? Right? That's like a nice term we like to throw around a lot. Let's be empathetic with people. Let's be really nice and ooey gooey. But what does that mean? Well, in my analysis, and this is just my personal opinion at this point, um, I think empathy has two parts to it. Uh, one part is it's a felt experience. When you're engaged in empathy, you are feeling. Uh, the, you are feeling the pain of the other person. You're experiencing that with them. The second part of it is active listening. And uh, we're going to go through each part of those. So, first part is uh, the felt, I want to get at what, this, what I mean by a felt experience of empathy. So you'll see in your handouts you have stories uh, written. Uh, does anyone want to volunteer to, if you want to, uh, yeah. uh, if, does anyone want to volunteer to read that story? I've been talking a lot. And I'm supposed to shoot for like an 80% me not talking thing. So, anyone want to read that story? Cool. Sarah had a long week in front of her. She knew about her presentation on Friday, but she also really wanted to wanted the busted screening to be a success. She can handle it, though. She has <coughs> SSD gear. Her presentation, though, wasn't going so well. Organic chemistry was... Her worst class and the professor was out to get her. She was struggling to come up with the first slide. The busted screening wasn't going that much better. Three people were missing on Wednesday's meeting. And she found out a fourth person completely forgot to fly her the part of campus that, had, that they had volunteered for. Sarah desperately tried to reach the three missing SSDP members to figure out if they had done what they said they would. One had, the other forgot as well, and she couldn't get in touch with the last one. Feeling panicked, Sarah quickly tried to organize some last minute publicity. Then she remembered her presentation and it was the next morning. She spent the rest of the night putting together slides and hurriedly writing a new script. During her presentation, Sarah felt groggy and distracted. She was worried about that night busted screening. Um, she hadn't heard anyone in class mention the event. An hour before the screening, she walked into the room and started setting up. None of the other members showed up till five minutes before. Only eight non-SSDP members showed up. After the screening, Sarah turned to a friend and explained, I'm sick and tired of SSDP. This is absolutely the worst. 
So how many of us in this room have experienced that? <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's pretty common, right? Yeah. So now I want to just ask, um, how do people individually feel when they hear that story? Empathetic. Empathetic. What do you mean by empathetic? Do you... I can feel how she feels better because I've experienced it myself. Because you've experienced it yourself. And so how would you describe how she feels? Um, frustrated and frustrated. Um, possibly let down by the people that didn't mm. fulfill their part of their responsibility. Disappointed. is a good mm. word. Does anyone else have any feelings that come up for them when they hear that story or, or have any idea of how Sarah might be feeling? What? Stressed out. Yeah. Stressed out. Like at her wits end. Mm -hmm. Everything was riding on her, including she, you know her school, her schoolwork, and also her um, you know her participation in the organization. Right. And, and neither one was going the way she had planned it. So it had her at her wits end. She was just basically stressed out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think she felt defeated. You know, just this feeling like, I don't want to do it anymore, what good is it doing? This sort of just pessimistic outlook. It was kind of like, um, sometimes I feel like, why, why don't the others care as much? You know? Why won't they come? I'm putting all this effort for Some resentment maybe she might be feeling. Neglect, possibly. Neglect. You can also feel for the other members of the group. You can identify with them as well, because mm -hmm. everybody's got their own lives, and this is all something that right. they probably are working on. I mean, you know, this is a group that I mean, I know I'm proud to be part of, and I you know, don't like taking a minute to do. You know, like, you know, I'm not in my group. Mm -hmm. and it's their group. Yeah. So we listed a lot of uh, a lot of negative feelings, right? A lot of sad, a lot of stressed, a lot of desperate and, and alone, lonely. I hear a lot of loneliness in Sarah's story. How many of us would feel differently if we were Sarah? Good, no one is there. It's good. <laughs> um, right, so, so we can feel that. As Sarah's telling us the, that story, as we hear that story, um, we can feel that that same stress and that same exhaustion. James, if you want to grab a handout right at the front there, um, we can feel that uh, just as Sarah is feeling it, right? I mean, I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one feeling. None of us would say we're one-to-one -one feeling exactly what Sarah is feeling. We're not. None of us are in Sarah's head. But there is something about I'm feeling something when I'm listening to that story, um, when I hear about Sarah's situation. So let's go to story number two. And does anyone else want to volunteer to read that one? Cool, go for it. Uh, cool. <clears throat> Joe was elected to Congress in 2008. He was elected on a platform of cleaning up Main Street. And after getting elected, his constituents in no uncertain terms let him know how he could do just that. His office receives letters, emails, and phone calls daily of people in his district who want him to do something about the gangs destroying private property and they want him to re revitalize the downtown areas taken over by the homeless drug <coughs> Joe also has two kids and he reads the same newspaper as his constituents read that document the rising trends of drug use and drug addiction in the United States. He also reads harrowing stories about the destructive power of addiction. So he voted with his fellow party members against eliminating the crack powder cocaine sentencing disparity. And he goes on TV and says, uh, it is the drugs pouring into this country from Central America that are destroying the moral fiber of our once great nation. It's hard for us to hear, right? Us in this room to hear that story. But let's try, let's try really hard and let's, let's try to, what do we think Joe is feeling in his situation? Think about his kids.